Call the meeting uh, of the, or yeah, meeting of the Land Use Committee uh, to order for today, the 21st of May, 2013. Welcome everybody, thank you for being here and thank you for those of you who are watching us on channel 16. Um, we'll begin with a um, approval of the minutes of uh, Tuesday, the April 16th, 2013. Could I have a motion to approve? So move, Anderson. And a second? Second. Uh, we have a motion to approve and second at any discussion, any changes? Hearing none, uh, could I have a vote? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we have three items to discuss today, um, and we'll get started with a, uh, a discussion that we've been uh, kind of brought before us when we talked a little bit about some of the uh, issues that we had, that we were dealing with, with the uh, Oh, animals, uh, the or new ordinance that we passed with the animals and the chickens and the rabbits and that kind of thing. And some people brought up a little bit about, uh, you know, sometimes the dogs are as much a nuisance or more of a nu nuisance than they were on, uh, than, than chickens would be, uh, that kind of thing. And so um, we agreed to uh, visit a little bit and relook at the ordinance that we have about do do uh, barking dogs. So. I know uh, Keith Edelstein is, Edelstein is uh, our city attorney, one of our city attorneys, and uh, Mike Caldwell is here with the police department to give us kind of an update on that and see what we might take a look at. So Keith, would you like to get us started? <coughs> and Michael, you're gonna come up afterwards, right? Keith Edelstein, assistant city attorney. Uh, as you just described, uh, my understanding was that you just wanted to look at how we address currently uh, barking dog complaints and uh, I'll provide just a, a quick initial uh, bit of information up on the screen before you is the ordinance that we presently have uh, which indicates that, that you're not allowed it's called a it's generally referred to as a barking dog uh, but it actually applies to all animals and it's a disturbing the peace that you're not allowed to have an animal to create a disturbance by making loud noises at any time of the day or night um, that is the ordinance that we presently have to address uh, everything from barking dogs to if you had roosters or things like that or anything else um, that would be uh, creating some sort of a, a noise disturbance within the city. Um, these are handled different ways depending on the circumstances and, and what the officers are able to uh, hear themselves. And I was going to have uh, Sergeant Colos uh, discuss that and then uh, <laughs> the point from when the Sioux Falls Police Department uh, gets a call regarding some sort of an animal disturbance uh, up through the point that they then present that to our office and then I can finish up with what we do with, at, with it at that point. So. Hi, I'm Mike Colo with the Police Department. Uh, I'm currently the supervisor for the animal control section. Uh, currently the way that would uh, happen is the animal control section would receive a complaint about a uh, disturbance of the peace. Normally that's a barking dog. Um, that would either come to us through our dispatch center or sometimes we do get those complaints over the internet uh, through the contract program. Um, then those complaints would be investigated by the animal control officers. They would respond out there, uh, see if the dog was currently barking or actively barking when they responded to the residents. Um, if they could find out or establish an address where the dog is located, they would attempt to make contact with the owners of that pet um, and speak with them in regards to the violation. Normally, the way that it works is the first time that we would be called to your house for a violation uh, of the ordinance, it would be an education piece we would speak to you about uh, the complaint that we had, we would talk to you about how you can uh, work with your pet to eliminate that violation um, and then let you know that we would be uh, keeping track of the fact that we were called to your address for the barking dog <laughs> violation. Uh, and in the future, if we responded to the same address again for the same type of problem, at that time you would receive a citation uh, for that violation if we were able to personally observe the violation. So basically if the officer responds out to the house a second time, um, there would be a record in the computer system that they had been there before 
and at that time, if they were able to actually observe the animals uh, disturbing the peace, they would attempt to contact the owners and then cite them uh, for the violation. If for some reason they were called back out and they were unable to uh, observe a violation, um, the dogs are now inside, they're no longer barking, whatever uh, made it so that's no longer a violation, they would give what you see on the screen before you, uh, the disturbing the peace log to the complainant, basically the person that's being bothered by the noise and ask that they keep this log. Um, the log is basically kept by the person who's uh, being bothered by the nuisance for 48 hours and they basically just log the times that they actually hear the dog or animal making the disturbance. Um, and it's basically a fairly straightforward uh, list. They just make the time that they hear the disturbance, say how long it lasted for, and keep that log for 48 hours. Uh, after the 48 hours, they call us back. We pick up the log. Um, the animal control officers then submit that log along with a case report detailing uh, what had occurred to myself. And then at that time, I would type up an affidavit for arrest and submit the log, the affidavit, and the report to the city attorney's office uh, for their review for possible prosecution. Typically, though, since I'm in the one in the in the police department, those those come to me. Um, sometimes they'll come to me before drawing up the affidavit to say, "Hey, look, is this even one that we want to draw up an affidavit on?" So whether I look at the facts there and I'll look at the log or whether they submit it with an affidavit, I look at all the facts in the log and uh, try to make an assessment of whether uh, there's enough there to, to proceed with a criminal charge. Uh, it's not really worded in the statute um, or the ordinance, but it, it does talk about the uh, creating a disturbance any time of the day or night. Uh, our office uses an objective standard, um, what a reasonable person would feel that was disturbing, and so we try to look at uh, the amount of times the dog has barked, uh, the length of time, the time of day, and those types of things, and take those things into consideration about whether we proceed with a charge or not. Uh, the log... <laughs> we do require that the complainant sign this as well as a witness. Um, that's because we're relying upon their information uh, we, because if we have our own information that the dog is barking or creating what we believe is a disturbance, uh, as Sergeant Colwell said, they would cite uh, on the spot there. Uh, so we are relying upon their information and we're just submitting basically their information. So we do uh, require that they do sign that uh, because and, and basically uh, signing that they are going to uh, be a witness for us because we can't proceed on with the charge if they're not willing to then show up in court and, and testify as to what they heard. So we make that assessment. Uh, if we believe that there was under a reasonable person standard of disturbance, <coughs> uh, we uh, file the affidavit along with a complaint for the violation of the ordinance. Uh, typically the way our office handles warrants on most things is that we will send a person a letter indicating that we have this prepared to, to file for you and if you would like to set up a court date we give a person that opportunity to do so if they don't respond to that then we have no choice but to go ahead and just file the warrant and then um, it may be more inconvenient when they're found if they get stopped for a headlight out or or something else and this warrant shows up then they will be uh, processed it is uh, most city ordinance violations are it's a PR bond it's a signature bond so they can they can sign out a personal recognizance or signature bond so they are able just to sign back out and but they are booked through the process and, and uh, have, do have to go through that process. So generally for things like this uh, and for most city ordinances, if we have to issue warrants, we will give the person a, a letter ahead of time um, to, the, to the last known address that we know for them, giving them an opportunity to set that up themselves without having to go through that process. So that's, that's the process that we generally use. Um, we're here to answer any questions or take any suggestions or whatever you might have. Questions or suggestions? Councilor Staggers. Yeah, I'll have to admit, I guess I wasn't aware of this whole process here. Uh, do we have many people keeping logs during the course of a year? Or... You know a number? 
I couldn't give you an, a specific number. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably type up about one affidavit a month. Mm -hmm. uh, we try really hard to address those violations with the officers themselves so that the citizens don't have to file out the log. Um, a lot of people don't want to be known by their neighbors as the person who's complaining. Uh, if we, you know, time depending and if we have the manpower, I try to have <coughs> them sit in the neighborhood with the windows down um, so that they can actually observe the dogs barking on their own and then address those complaints. Uh, unfortunately, it, we're like every other business or entity, we don't always have the manpower to do that, and sometimes we do have to fall back on the log. And besides um, not many people filling out these logs, how many actually go to court during the course of a year? I, I wouldn't have a number for you on how many uh, actually go to court. One or two maybe? Or? Uh, I, uh -huh. I can recall about two that I went to, that I personally went to last year. Um, there might be times when I'm not actually called to testify and it goes to court. Okay, thank you. Councilor Karski. What is the <laughs> fine for a barking dog if they do lose? If, if a citation is issued uh, by the officer themselves, it's a $95 fine. Uh, I guess I can let Keith touch on the if they go to court, but if they go to court, a judge could assign a fine up to $500. Okay, so they, they get cited. They have the option, pay the 95 bucks or go to court and That's dismissed or, or way up. It, if they would choose to go to court, if it got to the point where we uh, issued the affidavit and they agreed to appear in court, then the judge would be the one that would set the fine. If they were cited by uh, one of our officers, and that would be in the early stages, um, then they could just pay the $95 <coughs> fine and move on. If it's someone who we've continually had a problem with, the officer has the option to actually write court appearance on the ticket, which makes it mandatory. So then they would have to appear in court for that violation. Oh, okay. okay. Anyone else? I do have one. Um, <clears throat> just how much does it take, uh, how bad a dog or how bad an owner does it take to get the citation issued? Uh, kind of a judgment call I know, but you know, I, I suppose it's kind of like if the guy's cooperating and says, you know, we'll, we'll keep him inside or we'll work with that. Is that the kind of thing you're working with? It is. It's a really subjective standard. However, if we're receiving numerous complaints or we're receiving complaints <coughs> from more than one household, say we're getting complaints from both sides of the street or both of you, more than one of your neighbors are complaining, obviously they're going to address that more sternly uh, than they would if, uh, unfortunately, some of these complaints also boil down to neighbor disputes where this is just one way to get back at your neighbor for whatever reason you know like where they park their car or any other reason um, we try to be really subjective when we handle these uh, but fair mm -hmm. any other comments from the committee thank you it seemed to me we have uh fairly adequate uh, means for people to uh, take care of this situation if they, if they will just uh, take a look at what we've got and, uh, and the police and, uh, and the legal means to uh, take care of it also. So I, I don't know that we need to take it any farther unless one of you seems to, wants to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yes, if I'm correct, in looking at the log itself, it requires three people to sign off, doesn't it? Not just one person complaining, you need two other people? Actually, on the log, we only require two people. It would be yourself and one other witness. There's also another space on there that you could have a second witness on there, uh -huh. uh, but we only ask that they have one other witness uh -huh. besides themselves. Okay, so two people then have to that, be involved. Okay. Yes, Councilor Kowski. I would concur with you, Councilor Rolfing. I think we have everything addressed quite adequately, and most of the time it just comes down to being a good neighbor. So um, yeah. I think we're good with where we're at. Kind of uh, hearing a consensus there, I, I thank you two very much for being here and, and giving us a background on where this is, and I think if we, uh, we have some more people that 
they call us and let us know that there's a problem, we now have the ability to give them the uh, means that they can uh, they can take care of the problem through the uh, proper channels. So thank you very much. Okay, let's move on into the um, <coughs> deer, feed, deer feeding ban, and we have the same people coming up. So uh, let's uh, go ahead. Keith. Thank you. Keith Allenstein, Assistant City Attorney's Office. Uh, this came to light through, uh, we, we occasionally get, and Sergeant Cole can probably talk about, and you guys can probably talk about the number of calls you get regarding uh, complaints about deer feeding um, or deer in the city. <coughs> but I was just gonna give you a little bit of information about what we have available uh, currently and, and what some other cities have done <coughs> and, and some of the reasons why, uh, at least uh, that have been explained to me why those other cities have done what they've done. Uh, currently, uh, we don't have a, a state or city prohibition <coughs> against feeding deer. Uh, the only prohibition we currently have uh, is under state statute, um, which addresses um, the providing of a salt lick for use as an attractant, and that applies, <coughs> generally it's thought of as it applies to hunting situations, but it actually applies to all, uh, if you look at it carefully. Uh, but the, the, the downside to this is that the item does have to have some sort of form of salt in it. So there are products out there uh, that resemble salt blocks, but um, this is a fairly common statute throughout the country. And so these companies provide with these mineral licks that are salt free, um, so they don't technically violate this ordinance. Uh, you also have uh, the problems with, if people put out corn or other types of food substances, apples or whatever that, that deer <coughs> like to eat besides uh, the, the salt type substances, and this doesn't address those at all. But that's currently what we have, um, and that those uh, are typically uh, what we can either use, if, <coughs> if anything at all. Um, the problems that, that arise with, with feeding deer, uh, as, it, as it's been explained to me in, in doing my research, uh, involve things such as door, deforestation, uh, the, the ruining of of your landscaping and trees and all those kind of things by bringing uh, the deer into the city uh, the and other animals too. These Some of these ordinances that other cities have passed prohibit waterfowl as well, which we have a limited prohibition on waterfowl in some of the city parks and that kind of thing, uh, as well as turkeys. Uh, some cities have addressed turkeys as well, which um, I actually saw a turkey in my part of town, which would be very unusual just the other day. Um, so. I know people have a lot of uh, issues with turkeys in other parts of the city, but uh, droppings from all those animals, certainly the, the mess that it causes as well as the potential spread of disease. Uh, with regard to uh, disease as well, you have, uh, with deer, you have deer ticks, which are uh, the prominent carriers of Lyme disease. Uh, traffic hazards, uh, which we do have some, some problem with here in the city. Uh, in certain cases, it's actually when you attract uh, these types of animals uh, into town, you actually um, increase the, the probability that you can bring other animals, predators of those animals, closer and into the city limits. So that's been problems for other cities that they've experienced. Uh, and then just general illness of the animals themselves, uh, domestication or habituation uh, of these types of animals. Uh, by feeding them, you're, you're making them less apt to be able to forage themselves. And also, a lot of these food substances that are that are being put out are not nutritionally sufficient for these animals, and they get they get sick, and then they also congregate, and then disease can spread more quickly. So, for any or all of those types of reasons, there are cities from Missouri, Colorado, Ohio, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, uh, Wyoming, New Jersey, Oregon, Arkansas, Texas. Um, uh, that have all passed these. Uh, Sioux City, Iowa, recently just passed. A, don't remember the exact date, but very recently just passed a prohibition against turkeys and deer uh, feeding within the city limits. And in the state of South Dakota, I know that Rapid City uh, and Pier both have uh, feeding bans for those types of animals. Uh, so it's not just a problem, even, even just even in the Midwest, it, it pretty much spreads the entire country, at least that cities have, have tried to take some measures to do. Uh, the ways that that uh, cities deal with that uh, range from the simple to the complex. Uh, they're all trying, however, to accomplish the same thing. On the one hand, uh, trying to prevent uh, 
the feeding of these types of animals while allowing people to still feed songbirds and squirrels. And, and so they do it different ways. Um, there are different <coughs> approaches. Some just simply say you can't feed in a fashion that would be uh, construed to be towards turkeys or deer, and they keep it really simple in general. Uh, others uh, impose height restrictions, typically a five or six foot. The, the presumption then is if it's five or six foot off the ground, then it's not for deer or turkeys because they can't easily get up to that. It's for songbirds and squirrels. Uh, uh, Pierre's an example of that that uses that. Uh, others use that um, and or in conjunction with a, a volume restriction. You can only have so much food. Um, some say you can only have so much food anywhere. Some say you have to have so mu only so much food and at a certain height restriction. So uh, there are ways of, uh, of addressing these things. Some simply just have specific exemptions that say it doesn't matter how much food or whatever, you can't do it, but you are allowed to feed songbirds and squirrels. And <coughs> there are pros and cons with all of these. And if, if the, the, this committee wants to look at some specific language, we can certainly uh, draft some of that and, uh, you know, based upon the, the, these different types of approaches. But uh, my first concern when I heard that is, well, how do you, how do you allow people to, to feed songbirds and things like that? Well, cities have dealt with that, and, and there are benefits and, and downsides to, to each approach. Uh, the more complicated you make it, uh, you know, the, the more difficult it may be to prove. The less complicated you make it, the more it may infringe upon people's uh, desire to, to feed other types of animals, which we don't want to maybe restrict. I can also tell you that uh, a number of these cities, I didn't realize that it was as controversial as an issue as it was, but there are, it has been controversial in some cities. Uh, this, these types of proposals have failed in a number of cities uh, based upon uh, a public, you know, they call it an outcry, but public input uh, about people that, that want to feed and, and do those things. So there are, there are people on both sides of the story. There are both sides of the issue. With that, if you have uh, specific questions or anything else, uh, I'm here as well as Sergeant Colwell to, to address those. <coughs> Mike, did you have anything you wanted to add? Okay. Kermit. Yes. Um, I guess I haven't had anybody call me about this issue. Um, do we really have an issue here in Sioux Falls about this or well, not? I, I think it may, you know, it kind of depends on on the area. I mean, it's certainly a, mm -hmm. it's a bigger problem along the river. It's a bigger problem uh, out in the Great Bear area and things like that. So mm -hmm. it, you know, geographically, it's a bigger problem in certain parts of the city than it is others. Um, I, I know that, that uh, uh, we, I don't know how many, do you know how many calls we get? Councilor Aguilar may have a in, little insight in that. <laughs> Sue Aguilar, Sioux Falls City Council, representing the Southeast District. Uh, Councilor Staggers, I have received a number of calls. They were began uh, last fall, and it was due to um, one of the citizens of the Southeast District providing corn and some type of lick, and it was right off of Cliff Avenue where this was happening, and I received calls as far as safety concerns, uh, people turning on to one of the side streets. Um, the, ind the individuals that called me also had uh, talked about that it's very close to the river, so they would feed and then they would go down Cliff Avenue uh, causing traffic hazards. Um, the first individual that called me was very concerned because she had seen um, an accident with a deer, not in, in uh, that area, but how it had, you know, caused the driver to have to make uh, a quick stop, but the deer had ended up going through the windshield. And um, she was well aware that this problem had arisen in Sioux City and that Sioux City had passed the ban last November uh, for the feeding of both <coughs> turkeys and um, deer. And so I uh, contacted the city attorney and had been working with Keith 
um, as far as is concerned. The, one of the constituents that, that spoke with me told me that she had called the police department. The police department, about this specific individual, the police department had gone out there, talked to the individual, but this did not stop the individual from providing the corn and the um, lick. So um, Keith had kept me apprised of what his research has shown, and I had said that I felt that this committee was the proper avenue to bring this concern to decide whether there was a need for us to take further action as a council. Thank you. Councilor Anderson. <coughs> Keith, I guess I'll start with you. <clears throat> a couple years ago, uh, Councilman Jamison uh, requested that the city take a look at a hunting season with inside the city due to overpopulation. I believe that only happened one year, maybe two, oh, and, or is that program still continuing? Yeah, it's still continuing. Okay. <laughs> how are we, okay, then with that program in place, how are we sitting with our <coughs> deer population within the city? Uh, currently, we, do, we still operate uh, the archery antlerless hunt within the city that occurs in the northeast uh, part of town. We basically operate that um, through working with some of the landowners that own that land up there. Uh, they own the bulk of the land that they allow us to hunt on um, through their generosity that we're able to do that. We kind of work that with the GFP also. Um, we did some work with the state and they were able to um, see through the state car deer accidents that a majority of those occur um, on Rice Street and also through 229 um, heading north, and that's kind of where that hunt is held. I want to say in the last three years that that hunt has been held that they've taken out about 90 deer um, out of that area through the hunting <laughs> program. The hunters that participate in that program are basically all uh, civilians who apply for a tag and then are allowed to archery hunt in that area. Um, that way we don't, we're not expending additional city assets to have somebody up there just for the purpose of, of shooting those deer. We actually give uh, citizens an opportunity to go up there and, and have an opportunity to archery hunt that may otherwise not be able to hunt. Okay, thank you. Councilor Karski. Along the same line, has there been any talk of expanding that to the, the 57th and Cliff, the Oxbow on 49th Street, that type of thing? We have talked about it. Um, we did have a meeting uh, with the mayor and, and discussed some of those issues. Uh, this winter, we kind of noticed that we did get a few complaints where people were seeing larger groups of deer uh, in the city park system along the river. Every winter, though, the deer group up um, and then as it gets warmer, they kind of disperse. So it, it can look like the numbers are bigger than what they really are. Um, the Game Fish and Parks does not monitor the deer within the city of Sioux Falls. Um, they don't have a management number that they would be looking for as <coughs> far as the deer herd goes. Uh, we did look at expanding it and we are going to try to expand the season. Um, and also the area, but that's going to be in the northeast area of town again on some city-owned property, um, kind of in the area of where water reclamation would be now, um, and just try to continue those efforts to, to keep the deer population at a manageable level. Um, the majority of accidents that we're seeing are still kind of in that Rice and 229 area, and those are state reportable accidents. If I could, a um, couple Go. more. I remember years ago we had an issue with uh, feeding waterfowl, geese, Cobble Lake, that type of thing. Um, do we have an ordinance regarding the feeding of migratory waterfowl? There is an ordinance on the books that uh, deals with the feeding of geese at certain city parks. Uh, I couldn't give you a list of those parks off the top of my head, but it is <laughs> it was kind of generated for the Cobble Park area and to kind of deal with some of the parks that are close to the airport. So it's very specific 
in where you cannot feed that type of thing. It is, and it's limited to the areas in and around certain city parks. Okay. Um, your thoughts. I mean, you told us, I guess, a little bit about what other communities are doing, that type of thing. Um, from your perspective, you're, it's your job to pick up a deer, I think, if it's hit. Is that correct? Uh, the animal control does go out and, and pick up the deer and make sure that they get disposed of properly. Okay. Have we had many of them? Uh, we have deer on a weekly basis. Uh, I, wouldn't, I couldn't tell you if I'm seeing an increase in it. Um, it's something that we constantly deal with. We, we're removing deer weekly to a staging area, and then we dispose of them. Okay. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Tom. Yeah, I'm trying to, to figure out what the real issue is here. Um, is it because people are feeding the deer, or is it just because we're having an overpopulation that's taking place? I guess I couldn't, I couldn't really speak to that as mm -hmm. far as which issue is cr creating the complaints. Mm -hmm. um, basically, every time we receive a complaint for people feeding, we have just about as many people on the other side who want to feed the deer. Um, and so it's kind of an education piece where we go out and we let them know um, that some of their neighbors are, are bothered by what's going on, um, that it is creating some damage to other people's property, and then also let them know what's prohibited currently, which is only products that contain salt. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people that live in those areas close to the parks enjoy the wildlife and they're feeding it. Um, because that's why they chose to live there, and that's what they enjoy yeah. seeing. Any thoughts? <coughs> Seems to me that this is, um, Chair. Oh, yes. <coughs> Another Anderson. question. Um, similar to like the dog barking complaints, how many complaints a month do we get on deer, deer or deer feeding? We don't get a, very many complaints about that issue. Um, I would say the majority of the complaints happen in the fall and the winter time, and I really think that the deer are a lot more noticeable those times of year. Um, once the weather gets colder, they group up. They look like they're in bigger groups. When it's warmer, they're less noticeable. You don't see them. They're not in big herds. Okay. With that, if I can ask one yes. more here. With that, um, do you see any weaknesses in how we proceed right now as a city regarding deer? I think deer are pretty much um, something that cities all over the Midwest and anywhere there are just deer population are kind of dealing with as a nuisance. Um, I think we're dealing with that already through the archery hunt, um, and that <laughs> is helping with the population. I think expanding those hunting efforts is a good step. Um, I think if we, the GFP I know is in favor of discussing the deer feeding ban, um, at least uh, bouncing the idea around and looking at what some other cities have done. Um, they were unable to be here tonight for that discussion, but I think that's something that between us and uh, the game fish and parks that we could discuss the deer feeding ban, it potentially would be um, another positive step in managing the deer. But like Keith already stated, it's potentially controversial uh, because we do have both groups. We have people that want to feed the deer, they want to see them in their yard, and we have people that don't want them in their yard eating their plants and shrubs. Councilor Karski, you had something else? Uh, for Councilor Aguilar, Mr. Allenstein, go ahead if you have something oh, to add. I'm sorry, I just wanted to add. One thing in response to your, I think your question about expanding onto 57th Street and that, there are two things. Um, the hunting doesn't work in all parts of the city because, uh, one, you can't, even, even the animal control officers going in there because they can't be firing guns at certain parts in the city. And, and the archery, while, you know, a well-placed shot will drop the animal fairly quickly, if it's not exactly well-placed, then you have the animal wandering off into someone's backyard and uh, that could raise a whole other host of issues. So the hunting doesn't necessarily work in all parts of town. Uh, and there is some thought to the process, to the, to the idea that, that the hunting we're doing in certain parts of town, if the deer are going to want to be in town, could be forcing them or filtering them into 
even further into town to a certain extent too. So, um, you know, there certainly is uh, the possibility that we need, you know, it's certainly for discussion that, that something in addition to just the hunting because it, it may in certain aspects have the opposite effect and, and you can't utilize it all parts of the city. Can the city do anything about, I mean, I guess if I could, Councilor Aguilar, the deer feeding that you were talking about, <coughs> That was occurring on private property, I imagine. That wasn't occurring on a, a public park or public property anywhere. Yes, it was the citizens' property. The residents. That it was, but it was affecting Cliff Avenue and the side street that people were turning onto. Okay. And, okay, thank you. I guess what I'm, the direction I'm going or I'm kind of thinking as I'm working through this is uh, we don't have an issue right now with people feeding deer or turkey on public parks, that type of thing. And this is a discussion, if we could, Councillor Rolfing, probably it'd be nice to keep it open for a while just to see what kind of public comments we get, input we get. You know, myself personally, I'm more for eating deer than feeding them, but um, I, I know that people do enjoy seeing them out in, you know, around their neighborhood in the parks, that type of thing. And it's always fun to see wildlife and enjoy it, whether you be a sportsman that hunts or just a person that likes to go out and hike and do that. But I think it's, you know, probably right now not as something that we have to take action on, but probably keep open and see what kind of public comments we get. I, uh, I tend to agree with you, but I also think, think that uh, by promoting uh, uh, the growth, if you will, by uh, feeding them and uh, giving them uh, licks and things like that to come into town and to perpetuate themselves in town, um, we're, we're, we're going to cause ourselves some problems, not only as, as Councilor Aguilar said, uh, potentially some, self, some traffic problems and some safety problems, but also some um, uh, number problems uh, with, the, with the deer because it's going to attract more and more into town and that's going to that's gonna cause a problem that we're going to have to deal with later. And so um, uh, I think it is something that we need to take a look at dealing with. And so I would propose, I would like to hear from the Game, Fish, and Parks Department um, probably sometime uh, uh, July or August or something like that. And so we'll probably set another one of these up for July or August and hear from him, uh, him or her, whoever it would be, and, and let's, uh, let's do that if we could, uh, if we could arrange that uh, and see what's, uh, see what's going on there. You guys will handle that, and then uh, we'll get that on July or August, and uh, and then we can uh, take it from there. Okay? Thank you, gentlemen. One more, and that would be uh, Arterial Streets. And we had Chad here. Welcome, Chad. You need some additional water? Okay. Okay. Good evening, Chad Hebe with the Engineering Division of Public Works. Oh, we were in front of you, I don't know, maybe three or four months, mo months ago and talked more about uh, the past expansion programs and projects and funding. And today, uh, I want to discuss with you the process that community development planning and public works has went through to develop the arterial street expansion priorities for 2014 and 2015. Uh, in the past years we usually had larger uh, group meetings to talk about the development needs and where the pressures were and what roads need to be needed to be constructed and we just got minimal feedback um, during these larger meetings. So this year we decided to take a different approach and we met with 21 individual businesses or property owners. And these meetings were held in February and the goals were to discuss their individual development schedules and priorities. And so quickly I'm just gonna meet, I'm gonna list off who we met with. Uh, Ronning, Ronning Homes, Harlemi Homes, Dunham Properties, Bender Commercial, Tom Walsh, uh, Van Buskirk Companies, and it says seven, there's only six listed. The seventh that we left off was Lloyd Companies. We also met with the Bruin Properties, uh, Costello Properties, Signature Homes, Cindy Monin with Friesen Construction, Jim Sokup with Sokup Construction, 
and Pat Sweetman with Sweetman Construction. Also Sanford Health uh, of Aaron McKinnon of the Sioux Falls Development Foundation. Two home builders, which were Nielsen Construction and Empire Homes. Two engineering consultants, which were Saren Associates and Earhart Griffin and Associates. And then a broker uh, with NAI, Dennis Bresky. I know this is hard to see, and I don't, uh, but I just wanted to point out what this is. Um, this is a growth management tier map that we kind of used when we went through these meetings. And it's a road map uh, for the city's growth through the year 2037, and it's based on our sanitary sewer capacity. And it's listed, it, it projects where we'll have schools, libraries, fire stations, utilities, and then transportation projects as the city continues to grow. Now something I can point out to you, um, the tier one or the areas in blue are areas that we're looking to develop or grow today through 2017. The areas in green or the tier two areas, that's where we're looking the years 2018 through 2027. And the areas in orange, or which are tier three areas, are the years 2028 through 2037. <laughs> Following the meetings, uh, community development, public works and planning sat down and reviewed and prioritized uh, using the factors which are included in Executive Order 13-08, and that Executive Order is included in your handout and it talks about certain things, um, the number of businesses this, this road would serve, the number of public facilities it would serve, uh, street costs, traffic volumes, uh, accidents, uh, but the eight factors that are listed in that executive order. Following that, uh, we took our priority list and presented that to the local government committee of the Home Builders Association that committee and then that organization's board of directors uh, both passed resolutions supporting our priority list. And that uh, resolution from that organization is also included in your handout. Following that, we met, uh, we discussed the priority list with the Business Transportation Committee of the Chamber of Commerce, and then finally with the Infrastructure Review and Advisory Board and the Infrastructure Review Advisory Board also passed a motion supporting the project list. And all told, uh, we met with approximately 100 individuals during those 24 meetings. Now a few comments we heard um, during and after the meetings. Um, they felt that city staff has a good understanding of the current and future development needs. Uh, the priority list, as we presented, was supported. The HBA and others felt that redevelopment needs to pay platting fees. And one thing I should point out is that the HBA's resolution does include language that they want to see the .92 sales tax portion of this program be restored to the funding levels that it was at in the 2010 to 2014 program and they would like to see this funding uh, restored within three years. And what that means is in that, in that five-year plan from 10 to 14, uh, the 0.92 level of sales tax in that project or program was $34 million. And in the draft program that you'll be seeing here in the near future, it's at $26 million. So they're requesting that that $8 million difference be made up within, within three years. Okay, um, let's get to the list. So our priority projects for 2014 are, are as follows. Uh, 41st Street from Sertoma Avenue through the T. Ellis Road. This is out on West Maple Street, uh, northwest of Marion Road, and this is the site of the new Sioux Falls Middle School that's under construction. And so this, this road currently exists as a two-lane rural section, which means no curb and gutter. Um, 
What we'll be doing is doing some grading at their entrances to this school. Um, there's some sight distance issues with hills. We're going to flatten those hills out and then uh, widen a little bit to add a center turn lane. So uh, not a lot out here, but we're trying to improve the safety for when this new school opens. And finally, the last project uh, in 14 would be paving uh, 85th Street between Minnesota and Cliff Avenue. Today it's a gravel road. Um, what we're proposing is a, a two-lane rural section. And what's driving this is that um, we feel it'll be a heavily used detour route uh, during 2015. In 2015, it's proposed that the DOT will widen Minnesota Avenue south of 85th Street. And then we're also proposing to widen Cliff Avenue north of 85th Street in 2015. So, um, you know, when people are coming from, let's say, south of town, they're on the east side of town, They'll be able to use Cliff, uh, come up to 85th, take, take 85th over to Minnesota, or they could use uh, Highway 11. So we're doing this in preparation of uh, two large construction projects that are proposed in, in 2015. And tw yes, and then uh, we just talked about this. Um, these, this. These two next projects are the priorities in 2015. This we talked about, um, the widening of Cliff Avenue from about 63rd Street down to 85th Street. And then the next project is Sycamore Avenue from, 80, from uh, 57th Street down to 69th. Um, you know, there is talk about another uh, uh, Harrisburg school just east of, uh, or west of Sycamore Avenue, north of 69th Street. Now I got up here some potential. Um, expansion projects in the years 2016, 2017, and 2018. Shannon, would you just kind of run the mouse here when I, as I talk, just mention these and you can maybe just point out to where they are. Uh, the first one is, is Maple Street from Career Avenue to Marion Road. Next is 69th Street from Southeastern Avenue to Sycamore Avenue. Next is the Ellis Road from 26th Street to 41st Street. Then we have 85th Street from Louise Avenue to Tallgrass Avenue. 69th Street and Western Avenue intersection to complement what we're doing this year. And then finally Powderhouse Road from Arrowhead Parkway to Madison Street. And yes, that is the, the future South Dakota 100, and that mile stretch of it is the one mile that the city's been responsible to build. We built the west half uh, a few years ago, and so now we're getting the, the east half programmed in there to kind of coincide when the DOT will be building um, from Madison going to the north. Hopefully. Hopefully. Thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't pass that up. That's all right. Put the words out of this my isn't mouth. this isn't going directly to peer, is it? I hope not. Okay. Okay. Uh, this slide talks about the proposed funding in the arterial street expansion program uh, in the plan for 2014 to 2418. Uh, you can see the amount is about 53 and a half million dollars, and it's comprised of arterial street platting fees, uh, the 08 sales tax dollars, and then the 0.92 sales tax dollars. Here is a history of the platting fees we've collected um, from it, their inception, well, I'll just say from 2009 to, to date. I list the arterial street and the water, which were new in 2009, and then the, D the drainage system cost recovery and the regional detention charge that were in place prior to 2009. All right, what are our next steps? Um, we're gonna continue with the design of 41st Street. Uh, we've done a lot of work out there to date. There's a lot more work to, done, to get done. Um, we're anticipating a bid date in January of 2014 and a very long uh, construction project. And then we also plan on starting on the design uh, that we talked about on Maple Street, uh, 85th Street, Cliff Avenue, and Sycamore Avenue. And then uh, for you guys, this program will be discussed uh, during the review and adoption of the 2014 to 2018 
capital program. So with that, I uh, thank you for your time, and um, I'll try to answer any questions you might have. Councillor Anderson. Chad, let's talk about the proposed 2014-2018 funds. Okay. Uh, when this, when, you know, for the longest time, the city used the 0.92% as the arterial funding. And then there was the platting fees that the developers uh, paid in also. Then in 09, we passed uh, this arterial street program. Uh, the bill of goods we were sold was that the platting fees would generate somewhere around $6 million a year. And that the, the 0 .08 would bring in somewhere between three and a half and four million. Well, since that's happened, we've never got, we've just gotten above $1 million last year. And in your uh, proposed funds here, we're not going to go over a $1 million in a year coming up until 2018. So the formula that we were sold <laughs> originally here isn't happening. And the citizens are the ones that are paying the majority for these for these arterial streets. When are we going to relook at this whole program and and redo the uh, the whole formula? You know, now we've got the the developers coming back and saying that money was ours and we should get it back. Yet the agreement that we made has never been has never come to fruition. So why are we continuing to do this and putting the, putting the, uh, the, the large part of this financial on the backs of the citizens of Sioux Falls? Well, let me just back up to something you, you said first. Yeah, before, 09, the, before 2009, the program was funded with all .92 money Correct. and then some user fees. Correct, um, and that's what I said. Right, but no platting fees before 2009. Okay. And then starting in 2009 is when, um, now you will, when we were, it took 18 months to put this uh, program together, this arterial street funding package to generate more revenue. And so when we started this, of course, this was pre-recession and, you know, the city was maturing at a, at a phenomenal pace and, um, and you're right, things have, have greatly changed. Um, when we talked about this, we kind of talked about there's two ways to, I'll say, fund, um, whether it's arterial streets or parks or, or things like that. Um, it's platting fees, which, you know, we, we had been using some type of platting fees, and that's what we decided to go forward with. And, of course, there are our impact fees, and impact fees are paid at the time a building permit is issued. And so you'd have, um, based on what you were uh, building, whether it's a, a hospital or a grocery store or a single family residential house, you would have an impact fee that would be paid, um, that would pay for your portion of the infrastructure. So you're correct. I mean, when we talked about the, the, the funding uh, plan at that time, um, based on the way the things were going, um, it was you know, projected that um, we would generate about $10 million additional revenue. Six million between platting fees, and the, I'll just say four million between um, the arterial street plat, and, and then the point oh eight. Excuse me. Um, you know the the platting has been what it has been. I mean, we didn't see much platting um, when the recession hit. You know, and you're correct in saying you know the numbers have been have been small up until th 2012. I will say in 2012 we saw probably a lot more residential that platted because I think a lot of the, there wasn't a lot of residential lots that were developed um, during the recession. And you, you know, you see the half million dollars today and, and, and we've seen a lot more commercial this year. Um, my recommendation at this point would be as we see how the uh, arterial street platting fees end up this year and then allow us in 2014 to, to look at the whole program. Um, I, I know You called it a, what, a bill of goods or what was sold on. Um, 
I don't, you know, there, in, there never was a, a commitment, I guess, or a, uh, a formula set in stone that said this is how things are going to be funded. Um, I, I guess I'm going to disagree with you that with that because uh, if I remember correctly, we had about an hour long program on how this was going to work, and uh, it hasn't. That's that's just the the plain truth. It hasn't, and you know even during the hard times, we were removing money from the 0.92 percent to utilize that towards other road projects, arterial road projects. You and I have had a lot of discussions on these. But once again, it still comes back to what the council was told at that meeting as when we passed this, this resolution, this ordinance. You know, when we passed this, that is, that's what we were told. And four years later, it's not happening. I and will I'm say- not blaming, I'm not blaming anybody for this, but I'm just saying that this is not happening and that you know, to restore completely everything as in this proposal really puts it back on the backs of the citizens again. And I'm all for great for good roads and everything, but once again, that that plan that we were given four years ago isn't working. And if I could just make one more comment and then um, yes. Uh, I will say that when we talk about the 0.08 money, um, it was specifically written in ordinance that it's for the expansion of arterial streets. So it doesn't mean we're going to go out and turn gravel roads to, to paved roads. Um, and when we, you know, we when the recession came, we we didn't do anything on the outskirts of town. We we added turn lanes to 57th and Cliff. We widened um, Marion Road from 26th to 41st. So. Yes, the taxpayers have paid that 0.08 money, um, but it's it's been spent, I think, wisely on a ro on roads that a lot of people use, uh, and a lot of people have seen the benefit from adding turn lanes and reducing driver delay. So, yeah, Councilor Karski, couple couple things, Chad. Explain to me under the general comments you wrote: redevelopment needs to pay platting fees. That, that's not being currently done. I will explain it to the best of my ability. Okay. Um, if I wanted to go out and buy, let's say, four lots with houses on them and tear them down and build an apartment building, um, I can do that and I don't have to plat anything. I can just tear them down and um, combine the four lots as one. Um, I don't even know if I have to combine them, but per state law, you don't have to replat those. So that's where I'd say their, their comment comes into play is that as you have uh, areas in town, let's say the core, that are, for a better word, raised and then redeveloped, um, they don't have to plat or replat, thus they're not paying uh, platting fees. Okay. Councilor Staggers. So that means you want to try to get this in ordinance where they do it. Is that right? I'm saying that that's, that's a comment from the HBA. Um, mm -hmm. They just don't feel that redevelopment is paying their fair share. Uh, okay. Councilor Anderson? Okay. Uh, yeah, that sort of threw me off for a second. Go ahead, Councilor Karski. A Karski. Um, couple other things, I guess, Chad. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that the 0.92 funding level has been bumped up to the, um, the pre-2010 levels. Um, there's a lot of construction projects going on that are at the level of 2008 and before. I was just talking to a young home builder who is building uh, to the west of the T. Ellis Road, and you know, we're, we're talking about the need, and I was happy to see that the T. Ellis Road from 26 to 41st is on there. I mean, we got a lot of roads, Marion Road, T. Ellis Road, um, it, just in my district that I know are going to be needing more, more attention over the years. Um, so I'm happy to see that. But when I looked at the proposed funds, the street platting fees, you know, kind of floating around that $800,000 area. 
And in 2012, we were at 2.2 million, almost 2.3 million. In 2013, to date, we're over 800,000, probably going to be trending towards over $2 million. I mean, is that something that we're likely to see continue on? If well, I, I mean, I, I certainly hope so. I, I think we've, um, the platting fees have, have changed the way uh, some developers do business. I mean, prior to the platting fees for arterial streets and water, and pr probably before the recession, you would see potentially somebody come in and plat, you know, 20 acres or 30 acres and start developing. Um, now we're not seeing that. Um, and that kind of got us into trouble with having all this land and right away platted and, and not completing the improvements. Um, thus le led to the subdivision construction agreement and financial securities to uh, take the risk away from us and the taxpayers. So I hope so, but I, things are, you know, think they're developing differently. They're not platting 20 or 30 acres at a time. Maybe they're platting a street with 30 lots on it, and they're going to build, you know, and develop and sell 10 of those lots, and at the same time they're maybe getting ready to plat and, and do their next um, street so you know I'm 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 just I'll be curious to see where this year goes because you know uh, 9 10 and 11 were pretty flat and I think that would be expected with the way the economy was and you know 12 was a um, I mean we finally got where we felt we had a, a good number and you know the way 2013 is going I, I would hope we you know collect another million dollars um, or a total of a million of in the arterial street plotting fees this year Okay, got one more for each one of you, and we've got to... Go ahead, Dave. Going back to Councillor Anderson's question, the platting fees, that wasn't sunsetted. I mean, that, that's ongoing, correct? I mean, there wasn't a five-year, we're going to try this for five years. It's ongoing, and we're talking about adding redevelopment now, from what I've heard, to, or at least considering that. But we're not, there is no sunset on that platting fee. You're correct. Okay, thank you. Councillor Anderson? <clears throat> To uh, reply back to the uh, plotting fees for the core areas, I, I look at it right now, the city has spent tens of millions of dollars to help redevelop the core areas, which is somewhere that a lot of those larger developers uh, don't want to touch. So I, I just don't feel that the same way there. There are other expenses when you have to redevelop a property within the core area that would, I think, make up for the difference between the plotting fees. Also, just to, just to make a statement here, as of today, from the monthly report that we got from Tracy Turback in the informational, to date, the .08 sales tax has generated $15,243,327. The street platting fees in this time period have generated $2,298,763. That's broken. That is a problem right there that I see from what we were told was going to happen with this program that hasn't. That's it. Thank you. I think it's pretty evident that we need to keep, <clears throat> keep you on the agenda on this to, to uh, keep us updated what's going on why and uh, that it's a pretty important part of our uh, uh, land use and the council's uh, agenda going forward so um, keep us updated if you would will do appreciate it thank you thanks Chad um, is there any other um, open discussion hearing none I would entertain a motion to uh, adjourn so moved second all in favor, aye. 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 Motion carries.